The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for today's webinar from Capron Asia entitled Digitization of Retail Payments in India, Run India Run, brought to you by Capron Asia. My name is Zenon Capron, and I'll be acting as the webinar moderator. The digital payment space in India had been evolving steadily in the last couple of years. However, the economy had a big bang moment when Prime Minister Modi announced the demonetization drive on November 8, 2016. The stated intention was to reduce the level of monetary la money laundering and counterfeit currency in the economy and to raise the level of transparency to ensure that the number of people paying income tax increased in line with rising incomes. It was indeed a commendable move for the Indian economy, which exhibits high levels of corruption, money laundering, and tax evasion. During the Digital Payments India webinar, we will take a look at the impact of demonetization and the recent federal budget in creating the regulatory impetus for digital payments. We then take a brief look at some other factors that will be important for the success of digital payments in India as the government would like it to be, including the level of literacy and financial literacy, the proportion of underbanked and unbanked in the Indian economy, and the provision of public services such as electricity distribution and telecom services. Finally, we take a look at the future of the digital payments in India. This webinar is based off of our report of the same name. In this informative 45-minute webinar, we will answer these questions and discuss the critical trends and provide insight into what's happening in digital payments in India. I do need to inform you that today's session is being recorded and is run in listen-only mode. However, we really want to encourage feedback and questions from you throughout the webinar. And since we always get lots of questions, we're going to get through the presentation in about 30, 35 minutes and spend 10 to 15 minutes in our Q&A session. To facilitate the discussion, we'll use two features of the webinar software. The first is the viewer window, which you'll see now and the presentation, and which I recommend maximizing so you can see it in full screen. The second is the control panel where you can interact with us. The control panel can be open and closed by clicking on the arrow on the grab tab. In the control panel, you are welcome to submit questions and comments to our presenters. We will be answering as many of these as possible throughout the presentation and at the end of the conclusion of the webinar as well. Presenting today is Anshuman Jaswal, Capron Asia's India Director and Head of Capital Markets for Asia. With all of our housekeeping out of the way, let's get started. Anshuman, over to you. Thank you, Zanel. Good day to everyone. Thank you for uh, joining in on today's webinar. As you know, the uh, topic of uh, the webinar is the digitization of uh, retail payments in India. And uh, it has a lot to do with what the uh, Indian economy, uh, Indian markets, and India as a whole has gone through in the last six months. Just to give a, a brief uh, roadmap, uh, we would uh, look at demonetization and uh, its impact and uh, uh, related issues to begin with, moving on to some of the factors for success for digital payments. After that, uh, I would take a brief look at the payments landscape and consider the future prospects for uh, uh, the Indian market in this regard. So, uh, the digital payment space uh, in India has been evolving uh, steadily in the last couple of years. Uh, as all of you know, there has been a lot of growth in this space uh, worldwide. And uh, India being uh, uh, one of the leading uh, technology markets uh, globally, having a, lar a large number of firms uh, which uh, provide IT services uh, worldwide, uh, uh, certainly has seen its share of uh, uh, development, its share of startups in the dig digital payment space. And uh, until a few months ago, uh, it was uh, evolving very much uh, uh, in the fashion of uh, uh, an economy of its size and uh, compared well globally with the, the leading uh, economies in the world. However, uh, uh, there was a change in November 2016 uh, India had a big bang moment when the uh, Prime Minister announced the demonetization drive uh, for the country. Uh, the initial uh, uh, reasoning behind uh, the drive might not have been something to do with uh, dig digitization and IT, but certainly when you look at uh, the financial services space, 
and uh, uh, IT in that context, uh, there has been a huge impact. And uh, uh, a lot of what we are discussing today uh, uh, relates directly to what has happened since uh, demonetization was announced. Just to give a brief background, uh, when uh, uh, the announcement was made in November, uh, it pretty much removed 85% of the currency, the cash in circulation in India uh, through the banning of old 500 and 1000 rupee notes. And uh, it's certainly one of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the more not uh, notable developments of this kind globally. Even though, uh, in our view, digitization was not the primary objective of uh, demonetization since uh, uh, November 2016, the government certainly has tried to use modernization and digitization of the financial services as uh, 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 one of the uh, uh, more important justifications or a rationale uh, for uh, the uh, step uh, in the economy. In our view, you know, the, to some extent, it does not really matter if it was uh, a primary reason for demonetization. Uh, certainly, uh, the impact is considerable, and that is what we pretty much have to deal with at this point in time. And uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, uh, intended or not, uh, day payments have become one of the hottest topics of discussion, and this area is seeing a lot of uh, investment in the space and uh, a lot of new initiatives, uh, innovation happening. So there have been a lot of positive things coming out of uh, this uh, measure as well. And uh, if you uh, uh, follow the uh, Indian market, if you are uh, participating in the market in any way, you would definitely know that some of the leading uh, digital payment service providers such as Paytm and Mobiquick have uh, become even more prominent than they already were and uh, are uh, uh, some of the leading companies in this space. And uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, we would go this, uh, go into this a bit deeper later on, but the uh, idea is that uh, the larger players at the time in November uh, 2016 are probably going to be the ones that would benefit most because they already had a lot of the infrastructure in place and therefore can compete uh, more effectively with uh, uh, the existing banks and other existing uh, financial services providers. So uh, this is uh, just a figure in the background that you see on this slide. And the idea is to show the demographic advantage that India has. So this is uh, a look at the uh, population breakdown by age uh, in 2030. So, you know, uh, instead of focusing on the specific numbers, it's important to just look at the shape, which is the bulge around uh, the uh, 25 to 64 age group. And India is a more uh, a unique economy uh, in that, uh, uh, unlike, for example, China in uh, the next 15 years, uh, the bulk of uh, the economy would uh, be expected to be Productive. So, you know, uh, you can see a large proportion of the uh, population would be in the uh, 20 to 64, 25 to 64 age group when it is expected to be most productive from an economic point of view. So, uh, just to uh, build on that, uh, at this point in time, 54% uh, of the Indian population is less than 25 years and 28% is in the 25 to 44 years uh, age group. So, uh, uh, a common term, again, if you're familiar with uh, the going on in India uh, that is used is a demographic dividend. So the idea is that having uh, a large population, which is going to mature in the uh, next, uh, uh, you know, a decade or a couple of decades, and therefore be at its productive peak, uh, would give India an advantage uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the uh, global competitors, the leading global economies, most of which are growing much faster than India is. So there would be a couple of decades in between where uh, the country, if it utilizes its advantage properly, should definitely be able to reap the dividend. But it is a matter of conjecture and debate because, you know, we are yet to see 
very obvious signs that uh, India is uh, uh, clearly benefiting because uh, 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 as the next one of the next slides will show, there are certain uh, other parameters that need to be met before it uh, reaps the uh, dividend that uh, is being talked about. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether or not there is an advantage, uh, certainly from uh, the technology point of view, the idea is that having a young population, and as you can see, you know, 82% is uh, below the age of 44. So uh, having that kind of a young population allows for faster adoption of uh, digital payments. So uh, uh, certainly if uh, you are trying to move the uh, economy in the uh, direction of, uh, 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 you know, more digitization, uh, the greater use of technology, having this kind of a demographic uh, is uh, uh, beneficial or advantageous. Also, uh, India has around uh, 900 million uh, active mobile phone users. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, you're talking about the uh, number of uh, uh, unique uh, active users, the actual number of mobile phone connections is uh, even higher than this. So uh, you have an economy in which you have a young population, then you have a large number of uh, mobile phone users and around 40% of these users uh, 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 take advantage of mobile data and 35% on smartphones. So certainly, you know, the comparable numbers would be higher for some of the more advanced or developed economies, but uh, we can see that India is at an important juncture uh, in uh, its uh, recent history when the capability to adopt technology is also present in the population along with, of course, the technology that is being developed at this point in time. I would say that, uh, you know, in continuation with uh, what I have uh, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, even though uh, there is uh, a lot of interest in technology and the talk of digitalization has increased, there are certain social infrastructural barriers before we uh, actually achieve a high level of digital literacy in the uh, uh, Indian economy. So now we look at uh, uh, some of the barriers uh, that could exist with regard to digitization, in, especially in financial services. So uh, one important aspect is uh, uh, the relatively higher level of adult illiteracy in the Indian economy. You know illiteracy uh, in itself is a major barrier to digital literacy. And uh, in our view, uh, even though a significant proportion of the population has uh, the new uh, uh, unique identification, the Aadhaar ID, uh, biometric identification is also possible. So some of the tools required for greater uh, digitization, mobile payments and so on are in place certainly uh, the fact that adult literacy is not as high as in uh, some of the other countries in the world uh, would be a barrier at least for the next decade or so before you see the uh, benefits coming in from the higher level of schooling and education that we are seeing in the younger uh, uh, segment, uh, uh, the younger population in the country. Another aspect to keep in mind is uh, the uh, amount of pressure that there is on the telecom network. So even though uh, the tools are there in terms of, uh, 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 you know, mobile payments, uh, you have uh, a lot of innovation happening. The digital services being created are not always accessible due to a uh, lack of reliability uh, in terms of uh, uh, the telecom networks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, again, you're familiar with the market, you would know that uh, there is a lot of downtime in terms of uh, connectivity and um, the quality of mobile data, for example, would not be the same uh, across the country. It might be better in some of the urban areas, not so much in the semi-urban uh, and rural areas. So there are certain issues and there has to be greater uh, a provision of uh, telecom uh, bandwidth and uh, services before we can uh, see the um, uh, reliable services that are required for uh, um, greater digitization in terms of the financial services in the country. One of the reasons for the problems with the telecom networks is that there is a much lower spectrum for mobile telephony being provided in India, and it's estimated to be just one fifth of the spectrum of bandwidth available globally. So this is something that possibly 
in the long run, uh, the government and the industry can work together on to increase the bandwidth and spectrum available for mobile telephony. Another issue is that uh, electricity provision can also be uh, unreliable. So from the infrastructure point of view, uh, not having sufficient uh, electricity provision in semi-urban and rural areas uh, could be a, a major bottleneck. This is something that uh, the uh, government and uh, private sector infrastructure providers are working on. Uh, at present, you uh, see a lot of interest in renewable sources of energy. So solar energy, for example, is being used to generate a lot of power in India now, and the uh, uh, level of usage is expected to increase in the future. So again, steps are being taken, but this is something that would take some time, and to that extent, might be a bottleneck in the adoption of uh, digital financial services. Now we look at the uh, impact of uh, demonetization. So this uh, uh, figure just uh, illustrates that you know uh, these notes, the 500 rupee notes are banned, and uh, uh, to that extent, it was expected that the use of uh, mobile phones, for example, to make payments would increase. So uh, uh, as some of you might know, uh, the result has not been so clear cut. So we don't necessarily see. Uh, major growth in digital payments uh, uh, very clearly. Some parameters indicate uh, growth, uh, others don't, but uh, the economy is moving uh, in that general direction, of course. So as I said uh, earlier, demonetization was one of the most disruptive uh, events for digital payments uh, globally, and it did uh, push uh, India in this direction of uh, uh, digitization in a, a major way. but uh, uh, from the specific economic point of view, you know, the, for the Indian economy, it was both a desirable and an undesirable move. So uh, I've already spoken about uh, some of uh, the positive aspects of uh, demortization and how it is uh, uh, forcing the Indian economy to innovate more and digitize more. Uh, but uh, the fact remains that for the Indian economy, physical cash was an important transactional means uh, uh, until recently. So uh, what uh, you saw was, for example, for uh, small and medium uh, enterprises and businesses, most of the salaries of employees were paid in cash. So when demortization happened, there was you know, a period of a uh, few months uh, in which uh, there was a major disruption to uh, uh, something as simple as a normal payment of uh, salaries for uh, these businesses, a uh, 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 number of instances were uh, talked about where uh, uh, production, for example, and the provision of services by uh, uh, some of these businesses had to stop while the owners tried to create alternative means of payment uh, of salaries for the employees. So there was a disruption in the economy. And I think uh, 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 when you talk about some of the uh, production industrial uh, production figures, or when you're talking about the economic growth, there uh, was uh, 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 a blip that was seen because of uh, this particular uh, event. Uh, in uh, hindsight, uh, we would say that the impact of demortization, for example, on GDP growth rate was less than what was expected, but certainly there was an impact. So uh, there were some issues that uh, uh, people had to face in the day-to-day -day life, and uh, that was you know, not expected uh, uh, to that degree. Now we move on to uh, some of the measures by the government to encourage digitization in uh, the context of uh, uh, demortization and what has happened since. So this is just uh, a picture of a float in the Republic Day Parade, the uh, parade that uh, is held in uh, New Delhi to show the recent developments uh, with regard to India. And this float obviously shows uh, uh, digital India. So there is an emphasis on the government side to encourage greater innovation and uh, uh, modernization of uh, the economy. So there were uh, various means through which uh, government has promoted digital payments. So uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, around 2009-10, it had uh, established the National Payments Corporation of India. And this is the central body uh, when we talk about uh, digitization, for example, or when we're talking about uh, greater use of technology in the financial services space, specifically in payments. 
uh, certainly NPCI has led the way on part of the government and also on part of the central bank, uh, the Reserve Bank of India, because a lot of the uh, measures that RBI wants to implement, they're actually implemented uh, in terms of payments through uh, NPCI. Some of the other ways in which the government has uh, uh, encouraged digitization include uh, reduce taxes and fees on digital payments for example you know to encourage the small businesses the excise duty on sale of a point of sale machines was uh, reduced uh, there were efforts by the government to and uh, facilitate availability of point of sale machines so uh, you know uh, an important thing to keep in mind in the backdrop is the large size of the indian population so we are talking about a population of 1.25 billion and at the moment you talk about the POS machines being used to uh, service the population, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, demand after demonetization of hundreds of thousands of machines. So all of a sudden, this economy, which was moving along at a normal organic growth pace, required these POS machines. And uh, there was a, a bottleneck uh, uh, and a shortage in that regard as well. And that's why the efforts to facilitate availability of such machines were notable on part of the government. So government is also sponsoring schemes to uh, promote digital and financial literacy. It's not sufficient to have the means in place and the technology in place. The people have to be able to use uh, the advantages that the technology provides as well. So that is another uh, area in which uh, there is greater effort on part of the government. So just to give you an idea of uh, some of the numbers uh, that uh, we uh, uh, are talking about. So there is a government target of 25 billion digital transactions for uh, the current uh, financial year, which extends from uh, April to uh, March. So April 2017 to March 2018. So they want to have 25 billion digital payments through uh, the unique payment, uh, 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 unified payment uh, interface and the related payment infrastructure, which has been created by uh, the uh, NPCI, as I uh, mentioned before. So uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that uh, the NPCI has already created and is uh, in the process of uh, putting in place. Uh, some of it uh, obviously is intended as being the primary uh, means through which, uh, uh, for example, payments happen. So that would be the uh, unified payments interface, but also the app that is uh, provided by NPCI to uh, uh, work together with the uh, uh, interface, the UPI app, that uh, uh, people say has also been created to give an example of, uh, you know, a prototype of some of the uh, services, some of the functionality that can provide be provided on uh, a technological uh, uh, platform like this. So uh, uh, the government uh, uh, bodies are uh, leading the way and also providing some idea uh, to the private sector of what initiatives they could take and uh, what benefits they could derive from uh, these measures. So there have been a couple of schemes to promote the Bharat interface for a money app. So this is an app which again utilizes the UPI infrastructure and uh, it's uh, the purpose is to encourage greater uh, uh, digital payments, greater use of digital payments by uh, the Indian population above and beyond what uh, the private sector providers such as Paytm or uh, indeed the uh, banks uh, are doing. So uh, these apps will be tied up into the existing banking infrastructure, but they would also uh, promote uh, technology beyond what would happen otherwise. In all of this, you know, we still have to keep in mind that uh, uh, historically uh, 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 the access to capital has been uh, uh, difficult for uh, small businesses. So uh, when we are putting these measures into place, we also have to ensure that the small businesses have the wherewithal or the capability to take advantage. So for example, I mentioned about point of sale machines before, I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, there would be some associated fees and cost of implementing uh, this technology and uh, putting infrastructure in place. So uh, certainly it is important for the uh, government and uh, the private sector players to be aware of the fact 
that uh, there is a cost for the businesses which might discourage them from uh, adopting uh, greater use of digital payments. So, uh, as I mentioned, the SMEs were hit hardest, for example, when they were uh, trying to make these payments uh, in cash by demortization. So, for keeping those uh, issues in mind, the government has made provisions for the uh, Small Industrial Deve Development Bank of India, SIDBI, to promote the availability of unsecured loans to uh, ensure that bridging capital is available to firms uh, uh, to put uh, the digital infrastructure in place and to ensure that they have uh, the financial means to uh, back up uh, uh, the investment required. Another uh, important measure is that the government uh, 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 related payments, which are a major uh, share of uh, the Indian economy, uh, as would be expected, uh, would all be made digital uh, in the near future. So the infrastructure is being put in place. So uh, certainly, it shows that the government is uh, putting where its money where its uh, mouth is and is trying to actively promote uh, greater use of digital payments uh, in India. As I mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of payments and system indicators, in terms of uh, mobile uh, payments, uh, the answer uh, has not been so clear cut. So while we see the greater, greater use of electronic and digital payments, uh, it's not always gone in the direction that we expected it to. Uh, uh, and the reason is that uh, there would be a period of time when the uh, economy catches up with uh, some of the measures being implemented by the government and the private sector, and people become more comfortable with the use of uh, digital payments. So we are in the process of that. And I think it would take a year or two before we really see uh, the benefits uh, when it comes to the level of mobile or digital payments being made in the economy. So this figure uh, illustrates some of uh, the issues I'm talking about, because as you can see, uh, demonetization happened in November 2016. So there was an increase in retail electronic clearing uh, after that, but there was also a fall in January 2017. So uh, uh, while uh, the volumes are higher than before, uh, certainly uh, the growth is not as clear cut. So uh, we see that uh, uh, in terms of the immediate uh, uh, payment service that uh, the government has uh, and that is run through the uh, central bank, NPCI and so on, again, uh, uh, there uh, was a growth after November uh, 2016. So uh, the volumes are moving in the right direction. And you can see that in uh, some of the uh, other uh, parameters as well. So you can see here the tremendous growth in the level of uh, mobile wallets. The overall uh, 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 volumes, you know, if you look at uh, the numbers, we're talking only about uh, uh, 80 billion rupees as opposed to the retail electronic uh, clearing levels of uh, 12,000 uh, uh, billion rupees. So it's a small proportion, but certainly uh, it's moving in the right direction. And we can also see that uh, in terms of the uh, uh, IMPS or the immediate payment service, which people use uh, to make payments through the mobile. So the levels there are also uh, increasing uh, in the economy uh, and, you know, financial services uh, specifically. Now we look at uh, the uh, cost of digital transactions. So as I mentioned, uh, when you talk about the infrastructure, for example, um, and forcing the economy to move from physical cash payments to uh, digital transactions involves a cost for the small businesses, for the retail merchants, and uh, at times even for the users of uh, uh, the retail users of these services. So uh, this um, slide is talking about uh, some of uh, those issues. So uh, the first thing uh, uh, we discussed here is the reduction in the merchant discount rate, which is levied on transactions through uh, debit cards uh, by the central bank. So uh, when uh, 
demortization was announced, obviously the, uh, it was realized that uh, digitization and digital payments would be an important area uh, uh, for uh, the uh, retail users, for the uh, individual citizens to be able to transact uh, normally. So to increase that, uh, uh, there was a reduction or a discount given on the cost of uh, debit card transactions. And uh, uh, the new policy is in the process of being announced now. So certainly uh, both the RBI and the government realized that uh, the fees that they might be charging or the merchants might be charging with regard to digital payments have uh, uh, to be kept tabs on and uh, controlled to some extent to ensure that people are encouraged and they actually use the uh, means of digital payments because if this does not happen then uh, um, the economy would go back to using physical cash uh, in as much possible uh, uh, in a big way and this important uh, uh, period this important juncture in uh, the history of recent history of the indian economy uh, uh, would uh, uh, not be taken advantage of and we might lose uh, the momentum that has come out uh, of uh, this particular event so uh, cost is certainly an important cost of transaction is an important thing to keep in mind and recent studies by the uh, commission by the government and the private sector have also uh, uh, supported uh, some of the issues uh, that i have raised here so there has been a call for realignment of uh, transaction fee structure and uh, the idea again is to ensure that it makes sense for the common man to be able to make these transactions it's not sufficient for uh, you know the top 100 million the top 10 percent or 15 percent of the population to uh, make digital payments for, for everybody else to continue using physical cash so uh, from the uh, telecom uh, providers point of view uh, you know uh, when we talk about digitization, a lot of the payments would obviously happen through mobile phones and on the internet and telecom providers are trying to participate in the economy through various means through the creation of apps through uh, payment banks and so on so they have uh, uh, all of a sudden become very important players when it comes to financial services and payments and they are trying to uh, ensure that the fees charged by banks uh, is uh, reduced for these payments to uh, allow for a more level playing field and uh, uh, you know to encourage greater use of uh, these services because uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, having the technology in place would not be sufficient uh, new providers would have to uh, come into the market and uh, also uh, uh, the playing field that would be created for these providers has uh, to be level when it comes to the uh, incumbents, the large banks, the large uh, financial services providers. So if we continue to charge high level of uh, uh, fees uh, in the economy, it would be difficult for a greater adoption of uh, digital payments and therefore the uh, new uh, providers might also not be able to benefit and take, uh, you know, uh, make their contribution in the uh, economy and uh, taxi services overall. Now we look at another uh, important aspect of uh, digitization, which is the interoperability across uh, systems and uh, providers. So as you can expect, the government is creating the infrastructure through the NPCI. So you have the uh, uh, unified payment interface, UPI related apps, the DHIM app or the Beam app that I uh, spoke about earlier, uh, Aadhaar Pay app, which encourages uh, uh, retail payments, small businesses and merchants to uh, adopt uh, uh, digital payments. So uh, these are there part of uh, the public sector. Then again, you have the counterparts in uh, the private banks, the non-bank payment uh, and financial services providers who also have their own apps and their own systems and platforms uh, for financial services. So in this overall context, it is very important to have interoperability across the various systems and providers and uh, the industry as well as the government are trying to ensure that a uh, high level of interoperability is maintained as the uh, uh, greater use of digital payments happens. 
So uh, uh, there was a committee uh, instituted by the government called the Vatal Committee, which uh, uh, looked at uh, the financial services and payment space, and it highlighted importance of uh, the issues of interoperability and open access to payment systems for uh, non-bank uh, payment providers. Um, as you can understand, in any uh, uh, new industry, the uh, uh, existing large players uh, would have an advantage so the incumbent banks would definitely have an advantage and they might try to uh, 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 get ahead uh, in uh, uh, an undesirable fashion through the use of you know uncompetitive or uh, unfair means so it is important for the uh, central bank and the government to ensure that there is open access for all kinds of providers and to that extent, the Vatal Committee also called for the Payment and Settlement System Act uh, uh, of 2007 to be amended uh, with regard to open access and interoperability. The uh, uh, second slide uh, on this topic uh, uh, again uh, talks about uh, some of the issues uh, with regard to interoperability. So the example given is of ICC Bank and uh, Flipkart, which is uh, uh, service provider, retail service provider, similar to uh, Amazon, uh, basically an open marketplace. And Flipkart's uh, phone pay app uh, uh, and ICC Bank's app uh, uh, did not uh, allow for interoperability uh, and refused UPI transactions, the payment interface transactions from each other's app. So this happened uh, a couple of months ago and uh, definitely it was uh, an um, important uh, event to note because uh, it raised the issues of interoperability in the uh, Indian economy and is something that the government and uh, the central bank has tried to address uh, along with uh, some of the industry associations. So the 2017 economic survey also raised concerns in this regard. And just to give you a, a, a statistic from that survey, it was estimated that 56% of retail transactions between uh, banks were uh, declined and uh, most of these transactions were uh, involving smaller banks and non-bank payment services which were hit most. So uh, the idea is that when retail uh, transactions do not go through, it's the smaller, the newer providers whose uh, uh, transactions are not being processed uh, uh, to the level that would be expected and uh, it's the uh, duty of the uh, 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 central bank, the uh, leading industry participants, the industry associ associations to ensure that uh, this does not happen in the future and there is a fair and level playing field. So one of the ways in which we can ensure open access, fairness, interoperability is through uh, having an uh, independent regulator. So this is something that you know has come up time and again. For example, when mobile telephony was introduced, uh, the need for a strong independent regulator was raised. And uh, we have seen this not just in India, but across uh, the globe. Whenever there is a, a new field, uh, be it uh, uh, the uh, internet uh, related industry, uh, be it telephony, uh, financial services, uh, payments, for example, there is a requirement for strong regulation and often that is spoiled by independent regulators. So uh, uh, there has been a widespread debate for the, uh, uh, over the need for an independent regulator for the payments industry in India. As of date, uh, uh, the uh, current regulator, the Board of Regu uh, for Regulation and Supervision of Payment and Settlement Systems, BPCSS, is part of the Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of India. And uh, uh, the government has uh, uh, reacted by uh, saying that it does propose reform and uh, it wants to strengthen uh, regulation uh, uh, in the country through uh, the amendment of uh, the Payment and Settlements Act. And uh, it proposes uh, the creation of a payment regulatory board. But again, uh, uh, while this board would be more independent uh, than before, uh, it would uh, still be uh, existing within the RBIs, it, it would not be uh, an independent uh, regulator as some of uh, the industry has demanded. So uh, what uh, just summarize we are seeing is stronger regulation, 
but within the uh, existing uh, uh, central uh, bank regulator, uh, the uh, RBI. So uh, it's not quite uh, what uh, some people uh, would have uh, hoped for, but certainly it shows that the government is aware of uh, the need for uh, greater independence uh, when it comes to regulation. And hopefully in the future, if uh, uh, you know uh, there are issues with regard to independence, uh, the government might actually consider an independent regulator if the situation requires. A couple of the other uh, regulatory issues uh, include, uh, you know, ensuring smooth entry for foreign payment service providers into uh, the Indian market. As uh, some of you who uh, have uh, uh, participated in uh, the Indian economy uh, at different points in time would know that uh, it's not uh, very easy to uh, break into uh, the Indian market. Uh, uh, the level of regulation is quite high. Uh, some might uh, even think it is a very bureaucratic uh, economy. So from uh, that point of view, it is important to ensure that the uh, foreign payment services providers also have uh, a fair and uh, level playing field. So their entry is not hindered. And uh, overall, uh, once you have an economy in which there are greater digital payments, and uh, we actually uh, see uh, uh, some of these things that we're talking about happening. So, you know, greater adoption of digital payments by uh, uh, the uh, common people and uh, by uh, small businesses and so on. Then uh, we have to uh, also uh, keep in mind and ensure that we mitigate the systemic risk that would uh, arise from having a, a number of relatively independent payment platforms, which uh, among other issues would be vulnerable to hacking and uh, other forms of cyber risk. So uh, not only are you talking about some of the infrastructural issues from creating such uh, 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 digital payment uh, providers and so on, but also we are talking about the vulnerability that this new system would have uh, uh, from uh, external agents. So, uh, you know, at this point in time, uh, it's not just companies. We are seeing that uh, uh, something as uh, uh, critical as uh, uh, national elections uh, uh, can be had. And uh, there is cyber as as risk associated with all uh, 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 parts of uh, the economy of uh, any country, uh, any uh, market. So from that point of view, the more uh, digital payments, the greater digitalization of financial services in the Indian market happens. We also need to mitigate that system of risk that is arising. Uh, uh, just to mention uh, a concern in this regard, uh, recently uh, uh, it was revealed that the unique IDs, uh, the Aadhaar IDs that have been created uh, for uh, the uh, Indian uh, citizens, for uh, uh, the entire you know uh, Indian population, and have been adopted in a big way. So, 90 to 95 percent of the population is now uh, uh, covered by uh, this ID program. Has the unique IDs. Uh, it has been recently revealed that millions of those uh, uh, ID uh, IDs were uh, you know uh, hacked, and that information was stolen from. Uh, some uh, government bodies. So uh, uh, that is uh, the cyber risk that we're talking about. It's not sufficient to create uh, uh, unique IDs, to create uh, such digital platforms if we cannot protect those platforms from uh, the uh, different types of cyber risk and other uh, 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 associated risks uh, that might uh, come uh, from uh, having a more modern and digital economy. So this is something that also needs to be uh, kept in mind. Moving on to uh, some of uh, the providers of payment apps and mobile wallets. So I've already spoken about the uh, UPI app uh, that uh, uh, has been created by uh, the NPCI. Uh, then there is the Aadhaar payment app, which allows the uh, retail providers to um, make payments so the idea is that you know uh, somebody goes uh, to buy something from a small shop and that person does not require their wallet or their mobile or anything else just the biometric identification their thumbprint or a scan of the uh, iris should allow them to access the bank account and make the payment directly 
without having any physical uh, uh, evidence uh, 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 on the possession other than you know something as simple as a thumbprint being required so uh, aadhar payment would allow that and the government is trying to encourage great uh, use of uh, this app but again there are some associated costs and also uh, there has to be high level of digital literacy on part of Uh, the merchants and the uh, uh, small shopkeepers for uh, uh, the encouragement for allowing the greater use of uh, such apps in the economy. So uh, another app uh, I mentioned was the uh, BHIM, uh, the Bhim UPI app. Then you obviously have uh, the bulk of innovation and uh, change happening. uh through private players so there are a number of payment apps the you know i'm only mentioning a couple of them here in uh, terms of pay paytm and no be quick but there are a number of uh, apps that uh, are uh, being uh, created a number of platforms that are being created for digital payments and you of course have the important bank led apps so uh, um, we've had a mobile and internet based banking for uh, some time in india as would be expected and i think uh, now the banks are taking their uh, uh, innovation and their uh, payment services to the next level so you are seeing a lot of complexity and uh, the greater use of uh, uh, cyber security for example uh, through uh, uh, multiple factor uh, identification and so on uh, in uh, several of uh, the bank led apps as well so uh, definitely there is a lot of innovation and change happening and this regard and the bharat qr uh, initiative so uh, uh, for the first time globally uh, there was an initiative in which uh, the uh, government uh, through the npci along with mastercard and visa which are global uh, payment service uh, platforms uh, came together to uh, create uh, the use of uh you know uh, to create uh, bharat qr so is the use of you know uh, uh, more uh, uh, digital codes uh, for payments and this is a unique initiative because uh, it's something that was adopted by uh, the leading um, payment platforms or uh, encouraged by these platforms uh, at the same time so we are seeing uh, you know uh, uh, some of the advantages uh, of having the government to push for uh, uh, digitization of uh, financial services because you know there would always be a debate in whether or not uh, the government should be participating in things like that or be leaving it to the private players but certainly if you do have a government initiative then private sector players such as mastercard and visa uh, also uh, uh, have uh, the sort of greater interest in uh, uh, creating such uh, new initiatives and ensuring that uh, uh, the uh, uh, desired objectives are achieved for uh, the economy overall so the moment you have uh, these different types of apps it's important uh, as i highlighted earlier to have interoperability and that is trying, uh, the government is trying to achieve that through the unified payments uh, interface or the UT upi which should be a central platform for uh, all of these change, changes to happen and the important way in which uh, you know uh, uh, some of uh, the development uh, with regard to uh, the digital and payment infrastructure has happened is through uh, the initiative for payment banks and digital banks so there was a recent approval of 21 small finance banks again uh, uh, if you know about the indian economy there is a high level of unbanked and under uh, banked population Uh, uh uh and uh the use of small finance banks and payment banks would allow some of these financial service providers to reach the far flung uh, uh areas of the country which are not covered by existing bank branches or uh, the leading financial service providers so uh, the idea is again to use technology to reach a greater uh, 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 proportion of the population to ensure that they have regular and efficient access to financial services without which we would not find success in this uh, overall uh, move towards uh, digitization of financial services 
So uh, these banks would cater to the lower end of the uh, population of the banking system. And uh, in addition to the payment banks, we are also seeing digital banks being created. So uh, uh, these banks would only be uh, used uh, or accessed through uh, uh, either the uh, uh, you know online payments or uh, uh, online means to the uh, to internet, for example, or through uh, using uh, mobile phones. So, so there would be no physical infrastructure uh, for these digital banks. So SBI, the State Bank of India, which is a leading public sector bank, was the first to encourage uh, such uh, uh, digitization, uh, such a digital bank, and they expected to go ahead with this bank in the second half of 2017. But we've since also seen a couple of uh, 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 private sector players which are trying to create their own digital banks. So again, you know, when we talk about such an important move, it is not sufficient to have uh, isolated uh, growth or development or innovation. And it, uh, uh, a combined uh, sort of overall continued momentum is required. So I believe that some of uh, that momentum is being created in the Indian economy. And uh, the critical mass certainly is there for uh, digital payments and, uh, and digitization of financial services to happen in the future. Another initiative uh, was uh, the uh, rupee. So basically, um, uh, the central bank came up with the idea that uh, there should be a lower cost and uh, cheaper domestic alternative to uh, payment, payment platforms such as MasterCard or Visa uh, globally. And uh, the, some of the uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of thinking behind that came from uh, Union Pay in China, where, there, where we saw uh, 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 sort of a domestic alternative to uh, MasterCard and Visa uh, payment platforms becoming uh, very popular in a small period of time. So, uh, you know, in India, uh, Rupee has also seen uh, 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 some success. So, uh, the idea of having this payment platform is also to ensure that uh, there is a consolidation of uh, the various payment systems. So again, it's just talking about consolidation interoperability uh, within the uh, entire economy at uh, a more uh, at a lower cost and in a more efficient fashion so uh, that is the thinking behind that and uh, as you can see by january 2017 uh, uh, over 320 million cards were issued for uh, rupee so these are you know debit cards uh, some credit cards as well a bulk of these were part of government schemes so you're not you know, look talking about high volume of transaction on a bulk of these uh, rupee cards, only about uh, 30 to 40 percent of them would be used by uh, uh, consumers on a regular basis, which are not connected to the government schemes. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, we would say that uh, the uh, rupee initiative has met with uh, some success, and we expect it to uh, become uh, stronger in the future as well if it continues to. Uh, allow for uh, such transactions to happen at lower cost for uh, the uh, uh, payment providers such as banks and non-bank pension service providers for the merchants who have to pay a lower cost for each transaction as well as in the end for the end consumer who if the merchant is paying a lower cost also the end consumer will benefit. So from that point of view it's a good initiative to have in the economy because it would also drive uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, lower fees and lower uh, costs on part of the leading uh, providers such as uh, MasterCard and Visa and they would also have to become more competitive in the Indian economy. So this uh, brings us uh, to the uh, conclusion of uh, the webinar. Uh, as uh, I have mentioned, India is on a steady path to greater digitization and this process has been speeded up by uh, demotization and we are seeing uh, the greater use of uh, uh, retail digital payments in the economy overall, but uh, it is still uh, critical that issues such as infrastructure, interoperability between payment providers and cost to users are kept in mind as we go forward in this regard. So uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, listening to uh, this uh, webinar and I believe uh, we have uh, some questions and time permitting, I would uh, be uh, taking those. Thanks.
Great. Thanks, Anjuman. Uh, great overview of what's happening in digital payments. Yes, we have been receiving a couple of questions in the background, and I realize we're coming up close to an hour now, but we'll get through a couple of these questions before we finish the webinar, and then we'll follow up on email for any questions that aren't answered. Uh, there were uh, a question here. The first question here was from uh, David. Uh, so Anjuman, he, he asks, there was a dip in digital payments directly after demonetization. Uh, so in the few months afterwards, I think the, the volume and the value of digital payments in India dipped a bit. What do you attribute that to? And do you think that trend would continue in the future or are digital payments set to grow now in India? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, my understanding is that uh, we are looking at uh, sort of a, a J curve uh, here. Uh, it's used by economists. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, immediately after demonetization happened, I think there was a shock to the economy, and also people realized that you know some of uh, the means for digital payments, for example, are not quite in place. So I think uh, uh, it just illustrated that it would take a while for uh, the end users, the common uh, uh, citizen, to use such uh, uh, services and to move to greater use of digital and mobile payments, for example, among other uh, financial services. So uh, yes, there is a, a blip. So uh, we saw a, a fall in some of the levels of digital payments, but I expect it to uh, change and for uh, digital payments, mobile payments to grow overall uh, in the future. Because certainly, uh, you know, uh, a lot of innovation is happening. A lot of new uh, services, apps are coming up, and people are also showing the willingness to uh, use uh, these means. So uh, a change is underway for in this economy. So more of a temporary blip than anything permanent, I guess. Exactly, exactly. OK. Um, another question, uh, this one is from Michael. And so Michael says, or Michael's question is, could you please provide an update on the digital online transfer of rupee into foreign currencies, particularly for investment and financial securities so that's a good question i mean that's something that's been a challenge here in china as well around the alipay platform and the wechat platform is how does it handle uh international transfers when the currency itself is capital controlled yes so as you know uh, uh that's a very good question because as you saw in the chinese context uh uh, the moment you had Union Pay, for example, uh, uh, people started using that for money laundering uh, in Macau. So, you know, you come up with these uh, new technologies, these new means, and uh, there is always uh, the possibility of abuse and people take uh, taking advantage wrongly. So those are things that have to be uh, kept in mind. And I think uh, with those uh, issues in mind, the government is liberalizing, uh, liberalizing uh, payments uh, uh, slowly. So. Uh, you know, the, uh, the sort of uh, small uh, digital payments or uh, retail payments uh, uh, are one area. Uh, large scale investments in uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, equities or uh, other uh, uh, securities are another area. So in uh, uh, all of these, uh, 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 you know, uh, issues in all of this, uh, these areas, uh, there is liberalization, but it is still uh, uh, at a measured pace so you know uh, you are seeing this um, slowly the opening up of how much investments uh, indians for example can make in foreign securities for real estate so uh, instead of uh, going from say hundred thousand dollars limit to um, uh, five hundred thousand or a million the government would prefer to go to two hundred thousand and then open up later uh, further so uh, it's incremental it's something similar to seen in other economies in the region for example china uh, uh, but certainly it might be at a slower pace than uh, what some uh, of uh, the uh, foreign service providers uh, uh, might uh, expect it to happen at. Got it. Um, there's uh, another question here on um, from Rajesh. And Rajesh asks, uh, what about the payment banks? Uh, do you foresee payment banking, uh, do you see do you foresee the payment banks threatening the dominance of the traditional banks in China? If yes, what is expected from the traditional banks to counter this? So India is yeah. similar to China. I mean, India is going through this period where a lot of the payment providers are setting up banks. What, Anjuman, do you see as the threat of those to the uh, traditional banking system? And what are the banks doing to respond? 
Sure. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, at present, when you open an account in uh, a payment bank, uh, a couple of, uh, two, uh, three or four of them have already started business. So when you open an account, the limit, upper limit for that account uh, deposit is uh, $1,500 or there about 600,000 rupees. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we are starting at a, a, a low level when you talk about how much money can be put into these accounts. So the idea is to actually reach uh, the unbanked and the underbanked uh, people in the economy who might not have access to uh, the uh, physical uh, branch infrastructure of the leading banks. So from that point of view, I think uh, the idea is to tap into uh, uh, an uh, part of the economy which has not been accessed before to allow services to people who could not use banking services earlier. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, obvious uh, uh, result would be that uh, we would have new, uh, more money coming into the economy without questioning the dominance of the existing banks. But of course, overall, we would see that more uh, small uh, 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 businesses and uh, 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 people with lower incomes would be using uh, uh, these uh, accounts even in urban areas with good access to banking. So there should be some competition, but it won't be a, a, a lot because you know, the existing public sector banks, for example, and the private sector do have uh, accounts available which allow for uh, very uh, small uh, uh, balances in place. So, for example, uh, you would see banks with uh, a few uh, with a deposit uh, requirement of a, a, you know, a few dollars uh, even. So, from that point of view, uh, some of uh, these services are already in place in uh, uh, areas with uh, a large uh, a larger population, so the urban area, semi-urban, and uh, those uh, entrenched existing banks would continue to uh, uh, hold sway, but we would see uh, uh, some competition coming into the economy. So uh, yes, they would, uh, the payment banks should find some success, but I do not believe it would not. Yeah, I think the, the it's kind of the same situation here in China. I mean, we've seen these private banks set up and they've been a little bit slow in terms of gathering AUM and market share. Thank you, Anchuman, for answering those questions. Unfortunately, uh, we're hitting the end of the time of the webinar, and we were unable to answer all of the questions that were submitted in the webinar today, but we've been answering some of the questions in the background, and we will be responding to you individually if we didn't get to your question before. As mentioned during the session, today's discussion was based on the Digital Payments in India report, which is now available. For more information on the report or any of Capron Asia's services, please reach out to us through one of the channels uh, listed on the screen, and we'll provide a link for the, all the attendees and registrants so you can download and look at your leisure. That will include both the recording and the webinar slides. Once again, Capron Asia appreciates your time today, and we hope you found the information informative and useful. This concludes our webinar. Thank you for coming.